Welcome back everyone, 138 MMA here. We've had the longest break. It feels like an eternity, but we're back now. I'm here to break down UFC Vegas 67, but before we do that, I have some channel updates and some uh, some various different things that I'm getting into that I wanted to bring to you guys now so you know about them. First thing, I don't mention it a ton, but I do have a Twitter, 138 MMA on Twitter, go figure. Uh, I also just started up my Tapology. Now for my Tapology, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make my picks on, on all the fights that I make my picks here. I'm also going to put those on Tapology. Why is that important? Because everybody keeps asking me what my record is. And I'll be honest, I started keeping track and then I realized I'm keeping track at home and there's no way for you guys to validate whether I made this up before or afterwards for the whole year because I've only had this channel for like four and a half months or so. So anyway, I started up on Tapology just after the first of the year. I'm going to do all of the UFC fights on there and all of the Bellator fights on there as well as some other random fights that I just feel like picking on, picking who's going to win or whatever. Um, maybe some local cards that I have around the area, things like that, just because it's kind of fun. Tapology seems like a good place for that. But anyway, you'll be able to see my record on there. You'll be able to see who my picks are. Um, it'll be verified through Tapology, obviously, because they lock it out or whatever at a certain point. So there's that. Now you can hold me accountable for my picks, even easier, rather than just having to go back and look through all my old videos. But with that said, we have both of those. I am 138 MMA on them. I assume you knew that was coming. But last thing. Everybody keeps asking me for, for uh, oh, give me a parlay, give me your best three picks, whatever, your three most confident. I love doing that, but here's the thing. At some point soon, not there yet, I'm probably going to start a Patreon. Why is that? Well, because I got to get paid somehow and these videos don't pay. So uh, got to probably going to start one at some point and there's going to be something called a Patreon parlay. Now, for all of you parlay lovers, that'll be a wonderful thing because it's going to be a very low cost Patreon. I'm not trying to uh, you know, take every nickel and dime that you have, but I got to get paid somehow for all the time that I put into this. And when I do that, the Patreon parlay is going to be something that a lot of you parlay lovers are going to like. It's going to be at least three legs every single week. Uh, typically it's going to be UFC, but it's also going to contain Bellator sometimes because that, that's what we got. So the Patreon parlay is going to be a real thing. You're going to love it. We're going to get that coming out soon. I don't know how soon, but soon. Uh, just finishing out some stuff with, uh, with all the, the LLC work and all that extra neato stuff but anyway to ufc vegas 67 this is gonna be a great card a lot of fun stuff a lot of debuts a lot of a lot of second timeouts fun things like that so let's get into that the, the, all those fights without any more wasted time talking about channel updates but we'll see you in the first fight ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages 138 mma proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world out between these two ladies here, Sajara Eubanks and Priscilla Cachoeira. This is an interesting one because the weight class, 125, both of these ladies are kind of, I don't know, barely 125ers. They probably should be up at one uh, 135, but um, yeah, it's tough. One of them struggles a little bit more than the other, but let's get into that here. So for Priscilla Cachoeira, she is 4-1 in her last five fights, 2-3 and three on the other side for Eubanks. For Cachoeira, she's a power striker that moves forward, and that's basically what her offense is going to be. The problem is she has horrible striking defense. We saw that in the Jion Kim fight. Uh, Jion Kim won that fight. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the record says. Jion Kim won that fight. She got robbed. Uh, but anyway, Priscilla Cachoeira, she does have a solid chin, though, and that's why she's able to just go forward and eat shots with her chin and then throw big power shots, especially against someone like Kim, who does have pretty good striking and, and things like that. But but she doesn't have any power. So she was able to win out on that just by winning the final round and not the first two. Horrible decision. Judges suck. Um, but in this matchup, she's going against somebody in Sajara Eubanks, who's a power puncher in herself. She hits very hard. She's a strong girl in general. So that's going to be something that's going to be interesting because the striking defense for Cachoeira is horrible. Horrible striking defense. And she also struggles off her back. If you can take her down, if you can get on top, something she didn't struggle with in, in the Kim fight because Kim's a striker as well. And then she robbed her. Uh, I need to quit bringing that up. I'm bitter. I bet on Kim. Anyway, uh, for Keshwara, she does have the power striking. She does move forward and will control a lot of the a lot of the pace of the fight that way. For Eubanks, she's a good wrestler with some decent grappling. Once she gets it to the ground, she can typically hold you there if you're not super good off your back. Well, Keshwara is not. The problem for Eubanks is she really struggles with the weight cut. She's missed weight multiple times. And she also does have some severe cardio issues as a fight goes on. However, the first round, I do see Eubanks being able to get the takedown, holding her down, use that use that wrestling, use that grappling. Shouldn't be a problem there. Third round, probably going to be another Cachoeira round. So 
Going to be similar to the Jeon Kim fight. I know I said I wasn't going to bring it up, so I brought it up one more time. But uh, Cachoeira is probably going to win that third round. And if the judges are anything like that, there's a good chance that they give it to Cachoeira just because she wins the third round. I do think the first two go to Eubanks. I do think that wrestling mixed with the ability to throw a power punch is going to be good for Eubanks. So for me, I think th this fight is one you can't bet on just because we don't know what the judges are going to do. And for whatever reason, in the third round of a fight, they favor that more than the first two. Me, as a fan, look at this and say, well, why don't the judges say, oh, I watched the first round. I gave it to this person. And then move on to the next round. Oh, I watched this round. I give it to this person. And at the end, they've already gotten tallied. Not wait till the end of the fight and say, yeah, well, she won the third round. How did she? Yeah, she was good enough in that round. I think she probably won the others. And then give her the whole fight. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Seems impossible to me. But either way, can't trust the judges. In a fight like this, where I think it's going to be so, you know, tale of two, two fights, in the first part of the in the first part of the fight, you got the round one and two probably going to Eubanks by a decent you know decent amount, but nothing that's you know nothing that's super super nasty, no gnarly hits or anything like that. But Eubanks probably lose the third round because she doesn't have any cardio, and because Cashewera can hang in there, she's got a strong chin. So for me, I'm gonna pick Eubanks to win. I might feel like I get robbed at the end of this one, but that's my pick. I can't bet it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's right, move to the next, next matchup. Now, real quick, the order I'm going in these is off of SureDog. I'm not sure what the actual bout order is off the top of my head, but uh, let me know if you guys have noticed this. Um, so when I have my VPN set for certain locations, Tapology just says forbidden and you can't go there. Is Tapology not allowed in certain states? I don't know. Super weird. Not sure what's going on there. But rather than switch my VPN, I just went off of SureDog. So that's what you get. We've got Jimmy Flick taking on Charles Johnson in a flyweight matchup. Interesting matchup because the line movement has been crazy. Johnson opened as a slight favorite or whatever. Blew up to like minus 500. Crazy line movement. Let's get into this breakdown here and then I'll kind of explain where, where I'm leaning on this. So Charles Johnson, 4-1 and one in his last five, I guess. 4-1 for Jimmy Flick's last five. Charles Johnson should be 3-2 and two in his last five. Uh, I don't think he beat Jumagulov, but whatever. And uh, anyway, I, I bet on Charles Johnson in that fight and I still don't think he won that fight, so... We got that. Anyway, uh, for Charles Johnson, he's a decent striker with really good volume. His uh, his striking looks better than it probably is because of the volume and the way he's able to use that to put a pace into a fight. However, sometimes he does start a little slower, but the volume overall comes out to be pretty good. Um, he's very hard to hold down. We saw that in the Muhammad Bakayev fight. Bakayev took him down a ton of times, what, like 12 times or something in a three-round fight, and he got back up a lot. Um, he, and realistically, he... Made a good account of himself in the in the grappling department because of that. He does have decent grappling. I didn't write it up there, but he does have decent grappling. Um, but the cardio is what really helps him out. Hard to hold down, cardio, and good volume. That's Charles Johnson's path to victory in most fights. On this other side here, we've got Jimmy Flick, who coming off of a massive two-year retirement. Not just a, like a layoff or whatever, a retirement. So I wonder how often he's been training. I assume he's still been doing the jiu-jitsu because it's something that this guy's really, really passionate about. But how, how long has, or how much training has he done for MMA in this time off? That I don't know. Um, it's hard to say, but uh, he does have great Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It is, it is right up there with some of the better ones, especially in the division at 125. I don't know that there's many people that can hang with Jimmy Flick in the Jiu-Jitsu department. Now, he's constantly looking for the submission, whether that's on the ground or standing. It does not matter. In the clinch, uh, Jimmy Flick is looking for subs. He'll, he'll, he'll get you to the ground any way he can, and he will put that submission threat on you. He's looking for submission over position all the time, which makes him a very kill or be killed fighter. Because guess what? Jimmy Flick, if he doesn't get those submissions on you, he will give up position, and you can just rain shots on him because he's still looking for submissions. So for me, Jimmy Flick is a kind of boomer bust kind of guy, kill or be killed. He's fighting a guy in Charles Johnson who I don't think has a ton of finishing potential in most matchups. But against Jimmy Flick, that finishing potential is there. Because Jimmy Flick, like I said, he's going to give you the opportunity to finish him if he can't finish you. Now, for Jimmy Flick, that submission threat is there. For me, I don't like a play on either fighter. I'm going to give you a quick play here. What I think is the under 2.5, if you can get that play. I do like the under 2.5 here in this matchup because I think either Jimmy Flick gets a finish or just gives up enough poor positions and gets pounded out to the point that, you know what? Charles Johnson gets the finish. So for me... The under two and a half is the best pick, but I will give you a pick on the fight because I do make picks on this channel. That is what I'm here to do. Make fight picks. And I don't normally make a pick based on the odds. Um, but in this one, I'm going to because 
I think the odds are just too ridiculous. I'm going to take Jimmy Flick on, on a flyer here. Now, I'm not going to bet him, but just for the video's sake, to say that I picked the massive underdog, and if he gets the, uh, pulls off the finish, great. I'm taking Jimmy Flick if I have to make a pick. I won't bet it. Um, I'd rather bet the under two and a half. I do, I do feel pretty good about the under two and a half. But I don't think Charles Johnson justifies that big of a favorite. Um, I don't think he won his last fight against Juma Gulov. Uh, I do think Jimmy Flick could beat Juma Gulov. So uh, at least pre-retirement Jimmy Flick. We'll see where he's at now. I'm going to go off what I think of Jimmy Flick based on his fights currently, or, or his previous fights anyway, before the layoff. So I'm going to take Jimmy Flick, but tiny bit. I like the under two and a half better. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's go All to right, the next So one. our next matchup takes place at Featherweight. We have Isaac Dolgarian taking on Daniel Argetta. Now for Argetta, he is 4-1 and one in his last five. Obviously 5-0 and oh on the Dolgarian side. He's only had five pro fights. So 4-1 uh, and one for, the, uh, for the Argetta side. His only loss coming to Damon Jackson, who we'll talk about later on this card. And that was a short notice fight. Uh, so in this one here, it's interesting because both guys are primarily grapplers. For Argetta, it's that pressure grappling, pressure wrestling, ground and pound and control. He wants to get on top of you, hold you there, just hit some ground and pound, keep putting the punishment on you and grind out a nasty, you know, grimy decision to potentially get the TKO, but most likely going to grind that out with that ground and pound and control. And that's what he's looking to do in most of his fights. And that's what I would say that his best path to victory is here. Um, he does put on a high pace, but the problem that I, that I see for Argetta here is the weight class. He spent most of his career at 135. He does look like a 145er right now, but uh, I'm unsure if that's... I'm unsure really what I think about him at 145, so yet to be seen. I guess this probably wouldn't necessarily be a negative, but that's where I've got it. i got to put it negative because it's tough when you're just when you're just uh, kind of getting thrust into a weight class. It's something you've, you've spent most of your career at a different one. He's now coming up to 145. Yeah, so for me... The weight class is an issue, but not a big one. Very, very small negative here, okay? So either way, looking at the Dolgarian side. Um, and also real quick on the Argetta side, his only loss comes to Damon Jackson. Damon Jackson, believe it or not, people look at Damon Jackson as a guy that's not super, super high level. The dude, has, in his current stint in the UFC, yes, he had a stint clear back in 2014. His current stint in the UFC, he, his only loss is to Ilya Teporia. So that loss to Damon Jackson... No shame. He did damage Jackson a lot, but his punches were coming over the shoulder, hitting Jackson while he was getting controlled. So that's why he lost that fight. It was a closer fight than than some would think. So anyway, Argetta made a good account for of, of himself in that matchup with Jackson. Dolgarian. Interesting. Lower level of competition, it seems. Um, a lot of them are, um, you know, obviously he's getting them out of there early. He's never been out of the first round. Um, in fact, I don't, Maybe he's made it halfway into the first round. Not very much. He, like, steamrolls most of these guys. So, anyway, strong wrestling. He has really good uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and scrambles for looking for jiu-jitsu positions, um, taking the back, things like that. He puts his wrestling and his jiu-jitsu together, which a lot of a lot of fighters struggle with. It's either, either or. For Dolgarian, he does both. Now, I understand lower level of competition for Dolgarian, so that could be something to, to look at there. And maybe the reason he's able to put those together is because he's fighting lower level guys. But either way, I'm going off of what I've seen. Um, he's a fast starter. Obviously, he doesn't get out of the first round. And like I said, that first round issue. I don't know what he's going to look like past the first round. For me, both of these guys are looking to be grapplers in this matchup. And who can get on top is probably going to have the better advantage. I'm going to make a pick based on a bet I made based on the odds. God, I hate doing this. Okay, so here's the thing. When these odds came out, I think Dolgarian was like plus 240 or something like that. I got him at plus 220 for a small, small play. But I saw Dolgarian at plus 220 on a guy that's 5-0, and has looked really good. We don't know if that'll carry over against higher level guys. We don't have anything that suggests otherwise either. That he's beating these low level guys pretty easily. So if you're going to get me at plus 220, yeah, I'll take Dolgarian. So for me now, I can't change my pick. I mean, I could, but I'm not going to. The odds are a little closer now, so other people saw that as well. For me, I'm going to take Dolgarian. Not my most confident fight. In fact, I wouldn't bet it at the odds now. I believe they're both plus and minus one something. But when you gave me him at plus 220, I had to take a small flyer on that one. Um, the payout would be great. Um, I do think Argetta's really good. He's really talented. Neither guy is probably going to be looking to strike a ton in this matchup. But sometimes that's what happens. When you have two grapplers go against each other, it ends up being a striking contest. And then we have no idea what we're going to get here. But I do think Dolgarian is going to be the better of the two at taking control early on so i'm going to take dolgarian low confidence at the odds like i said but let me know what you guys think 
a flyweight bout between Alan Nascimento and Carlos Hernandez. For Hernandez, he is 5-0 in his last five fights, 3-2 and two on the Nascimento side. Both guys have fought different levels of competition, so there is that. But for Hernandez... Uh, he, the both guys are five foot eight, but for Hernandez, he is 67 inch reach, which is shorter than five foot eight. So he has a negative wingspan on the other side, Nascimento 69 and a half inch reach. So he does have a bit of an advantage there, two and a half inches for that matter. So, uh, in this matchup, I think it's going to be going to be a tough one for both guys. And I think both guys do have potential to get the finish here at, at any time. So I'm going to give you that a little bit. I do think the under, under two and a half is a decent play in this matchup. Um, but we're going to get back into the, to the nitty gritty and see who I think is going to win, but under two and a half, play it if you like. I, I'm looking at it. I haven't decided yet, but I'm looking at it. Um, anyway, good boxing on the side of Hernandez. Clean strikes. Now, I know that people might not think so, but, like, it, but um, you know, with some of his striking, but it, it is clean. It, he lands flush on a lot of his opponents, and that's what I'm really looking at there. If he's landing flush shots, and that's what I think he can do in this matchup if he's able to push forward and press the pace. Because something that Nascimento struggles with is guys who press into him. Somebody, somebody who takes away his range. Because although Nascimento has really good Muay Thai, he wants to do that at kicking range. Uh, so he can throw the hands and the kicks together. But he doesn't like to do that like inside a phone booth, so to speak. So for me, Hernandez's best path to victory is to close that distance and use just the boxing as opposed to the Muay Thai style range. Because uh, Muay Thai range and boxing range are different. Ask anybody who knows. That's it. Uh, on the other hand, his takedowns are not very good, but if it, the fight does get to the mat, uh, Hernandez does have some decent grappling, and he has a lot of finishes by rear naked choke, which in this matchup, a club and sub's a real possibility, because if he, if he gets in close up top, lands some of those shots with the hands, I could see him dropping now Cemento, who isn't a pushover on the feet, don't get me wrong, but he could get dropped and then club and sub with that rear naked choke, because he does have an affinity to look for that choke. On the other side, now Cemento, I don't think he's good, that, I don't think Hernandez is going to have the better um, grappling. I don't think he's going to have the better Brazilian jiu-jitsu by any means. Nascimento is the better jiu-jitsu player in this matchup. Um, so that, that, that rear naked choke threat isn't really there unless he can get the club and sub. If it just goes to the mat with one of the takedowns from Nascimento, I do think Nascimento is going to have the better jiu-jitsu all day. I think he's going to be better in that department. And he's also going to be better range striking as opposed to up close. So for me, I think Nascimento has way more avenues where he's better. So if Carlos Hernandez can play his game plan, get in tight, box in a phone booth type of style, and make this fight ugly early on. I think he can get a get a decent win over uh, Nascimento, but I don't think that happens more often than not. So for me, the pick is Nascimento. Hate the odds; he's a huge favorite, um, but I'll take Nascimento here as a pick. I'm not. I'm just gonna leave this one off my card. But you guys do what you want. I'm just giving you the information so you can make the best place for yourself. But for me, Nascimento's a pick. Let me know what you guys think. Undefeated prospects here matching up together in the Bantamweight division. We have Javid Basharat taking on Mateusz Mendonca. I believe is how you say that. Or Mateusz Bokau. If you see it on uh, any of his other fights outside the UFC, that's what he was called. So um, anyway, this matchup, both guys are obviously undefeated. So both of them are 5-0 in their last five fights. Interesting height and reach discrepancy here where the... Uh, the height goes to Basharat by a decent clip, three inches there. Um, but uh, Mendonca, he is has a 71 and a half inch reach, which is a very long wingspan for a guy that's only 5'6". Um, and, you know, Basharat has an even wingspan to his height, so that makes sense. He's at 69 inches. In this matchup here, uh, a lot of people are really confident on the Basharat side, and I'm not. I think this is a very close fight, and I actually did not make my final pick until today, uh, right before I started this video. Uh, so I'm not super confident in this one, but let me break it down for you. Uh, let's start with the Bosch route side. He's pretty much good everywhere. No, nothing that really like stands out as a glaring weakness. But uh, for Bosch route, good striking. He can counter well. Uh, the problem he does have is his power isn't really... He doesn't have a ton of power. I mean, he's a bantam weight, so you, you can you can accept that, the the lower power. But he does he does get a TKO or a KO finish if you go and get uh, multiple strikes accumulated together or whatever. But he, he doesn't have that one-shot power. So I think that's going to be... Um, that's his biggest drawback in the striking department. Otherwise, he's pretty clean. Uh, in, his, in his grappling, I don't see any big drawbacks there. Slick grappling. He's good at uh, searching for the sub. He's really good with the scrambles. Um, and he has the wrestling to get the fight to the mat when needed. The problem that Bashrat has is he just he doesn't stand out as being above everybody else in one particular area. But he's looked pretty good so far. So I do think he's a solid, well-rounded prospect. I think he can go pretty far in the UFC. On the other side, we have Mendonca. Now, Mendonca, he's a bad dude. Like, uh, there's some stories about this guy, like, from Brazil or whatever, where he just does not screw around. Inside the cage, outside the cage, does not matter. Look him up. It's really fun. I don't want to put a bunch of these up on YouTube because, I don't know, I don't want to get flagged for any 
foul language or any crazy stuff I'm saying. But either way, <laughs> Manance is a bad dude. Uh, does not care about any of that crap. So uh, wild, powerful striking. So the opposite of Basharat. But the thing that I do like from Mendonca is that he can either initiate the striking or sit back and counter and do both about equally as well. So whether the fight's coming to him or he's bringing the fight to his opponent, he has the control over the pace and the ability to dictate whether or not he wants to initiate or counter strike. And he does well in both areas. So, so I do like that about him. Does have good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well. The grappling... It's going to be close. Both guys are pretty good in the grappling. He's an all-action style fighter. He doesn't... If, if he is counter-striking, it's not because he's just waiting for his opponent. He's he's then he's making it because this, his opponent is an aggressive fighter. And he's using the counter-striking in that sense. He's not going to sit there and just do the the, the Mortal Kombat characters waiting to, uh, waiting to fight. Because nobody's touching the controller. Where they're just dancing back and forth with the hands moving. He's not doing that. You see that a lot with uh, with counter-strikers. You don't have to worry about that for Mendonca. He'll come forward and initiate in that instance. So... Uh, the one thing that I don't, well, there's two things I don't like. One is his striking defense. It's terrible. He will get hit while he's winging wild strikes. But the thing I really don't like is his takedowns are very sloppy. The thing I do like is that he'll mix them in with his striking. He'll go from striking to shooting takedowns or whatever, and he can get the takedown because he's a strong, athletic individual. But his takedowns can be kind of sloppy. And against a guy like Bashara, I think that's a bad idea to shoot a sloppy takedown like that. Maybe we won't have to worry about it here if you're on the Mendonca side, but it's something that I'm not... And I'm not a big fan of his his, his uh, sloppy takedowns. Um, and the striking defense is an issue for him. But like I said, the, the one-shot power of Basharat's not there. And with the countering ability of Mendonca, I, yeah, that's a scary one for me. So this matchup is close. I want to pick Mendonca, but I'm going to lean Basharat just the tiniest bit. I might regret that. I would not bet this fight. A lot of people are parlaying Basharat with a, with a couple other guys on this card. I would not do that. I'm leaving this one off. Two undefeated fighters. We've never really seen a glaring weakness on either of their sides. I wish I could pick Mendonca here. I actually really, I really like him. I, was, I became a fan of his while I was researching for the Dana Wise Contender Series matchup he had. You can watch my video on that. It doesn't really apply anymore when he beat up uh, Ashika Jim in that matchup. Um, yeah, I mean, I was big on him then. I'm big on him here, but I just think that Basra has just more tools that are more polished everywhere. So on paper, I'm going to give it to Basra, but it's way too close for me to place a bet on. And I do not, I do not like that one, especially when neither guy ever loses. So for me, I'll take Basra for the sake of a pick. Not confident in it. I wish I could pick Mendonca here. Yeah, whatever. Let me know what you guys think. We'll see you in the next fight. There's some more that I'm way more confident. enjoying this video. Do me a favor, hit like. I appreciate it. Let's get into this fight. We have Mateusz Rebecki taking on Nick Fior. In this matchup, we have a 16 and one taking on a six and zero. Oh. Now this this matchup is short notice and it does take place at lightweight. Uh, so in this matchup, though, the, the 6-0 short notice replacement here does have a pretty good height advantage. He's 5'11", as opposed to 5'7", on the Rebecca side. So that's an interesting thing coming into this. So if Fior can use that, that height advantage in this matchup, that should help him, at least in the striking department. Um, he does have some good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well, so that's nice. Uh, good, decent grappling. Uh, the thing that Fior is struggles with is striking defense. Now, with, with a height advantage like this, he may be able to get away with some of that in this matchup, not having to worry too much about that. The lean back works when you're drastically higher than your, or taller than your opponent. So he might be able to get away with the bad striking defense here. That jiu-jitsu is solid, though. I do like that out of him. Um, he has had a low level of competition, so the wins are coming against guys that are typically with losing records. Uh, and this, obviously, is a short notice matchup. On the Rebecca side, he's looked very impressive. He's an aggressive fighter with a high pace, solid grappling, Hits hard and good cardio. I don't see any real glaring negatives here. He's only got one loss and obviously 16 wins against a much higher level of competition. So for me, I think this pick is pretty clear. I'm going to take the Rebecca side. Um, I mean, the odds are ridiculous. So, I mean, play it if you want, I guess. But, like, it's pretty unreal. So I'm not going to play it. But Rebecca's the pick. Minus 700 or something favorite. Eh, what do you do? In the middleweight Next division, fight. we have Abdul Razak Al-Hassan taking on Claudio Ribeiro. This matchup here, 10 and 2 uh, versus 11 and 5, the records look close. But when you take a look at the last five fights, Ribeiro was 5 and 0 in his last five. 1 and 4 for Abdul Razak Al Hassan. That one win is over uh, Alessio De Chirico, who is no longer in the UFC. He's retired. Well, he wasn't looking looking good himself. But that's okay. You know what? Both guys can throw throw hands. Both guys got tons of power in this matchup. For uh, Al Hassan. He is much older than you would you would think he is. He's 37 years old as opposed to the 30 year old Ribeiro. Um, the 37 year you think okay he's only 11 and five. What happened? He get a late start to his career. Yep, that's what happened. So uh, he's five foot ten with a 73 inch reach as opposed to six one with a 77 inch reach. 
So all the real physical intangibles there are going to be on the Ribeiro side. So I do like that there. Um, for Al Hassan, he does have some solid judo. I believe he was on the national team in Ghana, but what the problem is, he doesn't ever use it. So he doesn't really use his judo. It's there, but if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Isn't that what they say? So he doesn't really use it, um, but he does have a ton of power. His head kick is nasty, and if he's going to win, it's probably by a head kick knockout. Um, but he's also kind of low volume at times, and his takedown defense is poor. On the other hand, for Ribeiro, he also sucks at takedown defense. So there's that, um, but he does have the ability to get back up. So if he does get taken down, he can get back up to his feet. He's done that plenty of times. Um, he does have some good boxing. He can counter. He's got good footwork. But the problem is his striking defense isn't good if that footwork isn't doing it for him. So if he can't get out of the way with the footwork, he doesn't really he doesn't really you know block a lot of shots. He doesn't have a lot of good head movement or anything like that. But he does have good boxing offensively, so I do like that. Um, he does have forward pressure with some power in the hands, so that that helps him out a lot. But he does completely lack much uh he lacks, lacks a lot in the way of grappling i won't say everything he doesn't completely lack grappling but he lacks a lot of grappling um and his striking defense like i said is not that good so this is gonna be an all offense no defense kind of fight from my understanding um inside the distance is probably the best play but then you know what happens if you get a real low volume fight where they just look at each other the whole time and then nothing happens totally could happen but i'm thinking inside the distance is probably a better play um uh, if i'm to make a pick i do like ribero here he's probably the better fighter he's a younger fighter physical intangibles are there I, I just think he's gonna be able to get this done uh hassan has been in a super sl rough slump lately one and four is not a good look especially when the one win is over to kiriko who is retired now so that's what i've got uh let me know what you guys think uh last i saw ribero was like plus 100 for even money but uh that probably has changed some so let me know i'll Massive see you guys match up here in the bantamweight division between umar Nurmagomedov and hayoni barcellos barcellos 17 and 3 on his career but 3 and 2 in the last five Age may be catching up to him, but he did look really good in that last time out. On the other side, 15-0, obviously 5-0 in the last five. That's how that works. He's only 26 years old, so he's an up-and-coming prospect. But he's had 15 fights in that early career. He does have a slight height and reach advantage on the Nurmagomedov side. 5'8 with a 69-inch reach as opposed to 5'7, 67 on the other side. How does this stack up? Both guys, very talented wrestlers. Both guys, solid in the grappling department. So we're going to go down. We're going to start with, we're just, let's go down with the Barcelo side first. Then we'll go over to the Nurmagomedov side. We've got a strong wrestler in Barcelos. We've got solid Brazilian jiu-jitsu, good Muay Thai, good boxing, power in both skill sets, as you see at market there. Uh, excellent takedown defense in the UFC. 93% takedown defense in the UFC. That's incredible. Um, and, but the problem is this is striking defense. Eh, so-so. He does get hit. Does have a pretty good chin, but he does get hit quite a bit. On the other side, for Umar Nurmagomedov, he has great wrestling. Chains his takedowns together amazingly. He does have great grappling once he gets the fight to the mat. He can control you, wrap you up, whatever he's got to do. Strong striking, solid kicks. He, the thing is, about his kicks is he can get you at both levels with both, or all three levels with both legs. He can use lead leg, rear leg, switch kicks, legs, body, head, doesn't matter. And they all look just as crisp. It's not, it's not like he has one side he favors and he can just do the other. It looks crisp everywhere. So his kicks are very good. He doesn't use a ton of just boxing combinations per se, but his boxing's fine. It's not bad. Um, does have outstanding cardio. I've never seen this guy tired in all 15 of his fights. Never looks tired. Um, and not, not only that, but he's very, very hard to hit. Unlike Barcelos, Nurmagomedov has a 0 0.37 significant strikes absorbed per minute in the UFC. That's just crazy to me. The guy is hard to beat. He's very hard to hurt. And if you can't hurt a guy, it's going to be hard to beat him. This fight should probably be closer on paper than the odds suggest, but I understand why the odds are where they're at. You pay the tax for the Nurmaga Madoff name, so you got that, but also you've got a much younger, physically more power or more, you know, speedy, probably more powerful, better cardio, better everywhere physically at their age in their career on the Nurmaga Madoff side. So for me, I think that Nurmaga Madoff is the clear pick here. Can you bet him at those odds? Not really. I mean, what are you going to do? Parlay him with who? Uh, there's not really anybody on the card that I feel super confident parlaying him with. Even if you put him in what was like Rebecca or whatever, he's minus 700, you still don't get a playable odds. So I don't like the play, but I do think Nurmaga Maidow is going to get this one done. Maybe you play the over. I think both guys are durable enough to keep this one going uh, late into the round. Play the over maybe. But uh, I do like Nurmaga Maidow here. He's the pick. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think Barcelos gets the upset of a lifetime? And if so, what does that do for Barcelos? Does he stick around for a lot longer? Does he look at Is he looking at retiring? Hey, maybe if you get a win over Nurmagomedov, you say, hey, I just beat this 15-0 prospect, done, out. I don't think so. I don't think he's going to retire after that. But but either way, let me know what you guys think. I'd love to hear your opinions. I'll see you guys in the next Bantamweight division. We have Raquel Pennington taking on Ketlin Vieira. 
Uh, for for Vieira, she's three and two in her last five fights, four and one on the Pennington side. Both ladies kind of in that same area in their career where they're um, kind of just outside of the reach of a title shot. Where both ladies with a good win here and maybe another one or two after this could propel themselves up to being a potential title challenger. Probably not winning the belt because they're going to be fighting Amanda Nunes, but they could get up there. Um, either way, both ladies pretty much decent everywhere. Jack of all trades, or I guess Jill of all trades, is that a thing? Uh, in this matchup here, so both ladies are pretty much decent everywhere. No area where they're just poor, but um, but they do both kind of have certain areas I want to highlight. So on the Vieira side, she does have some pretty good grappling with some decent takedowns, um, and the takedown defense is there as well. So she's not getting taken down, but she can land takedowns. And once she gets the fight to the mat, she can control and kind of work in her strikes from there. The problem is she can't get held up against the cage. We've seen it before. She did beat Holly Holm uh, after being held up against the cage most of the fight, but won the fight. Um, so she can't be held up against the cage. So keep that in mind. Uh, for Pennington, she's decent everywhere as well, obviously. But where, where does she excel? She excels in the cage push with the dirty boxing. That is her best path to victory in most fights. Press you up against the cage, hold you there, and just work body shots, work, work a shot up the head, you know. Do just enough to kind of score up some points, win minutes. She is good at that. She has some solid boxing at range. Uh, nothing spectacular, but she's good at keeping her hands up, using her striking defense, and throwing out good, clean punches at, back at you, um, and walking forward while doing so. The problem on the Pennington side, she's a very low finishing upside. If there's a finish in this matchup, it will be on the Vera side. I do not see Ra Raquel Pennington getting the finish. Short of maybe like a nice liver shot that she just kind of gets from against the cage. I don't see it happening, but it's possible. Either way, Pennington versus Vieira. How do I see this going? <clears throat> well, we have a we have a big discrepancy in two things, and this is why I'm picking who I'm picking. It's the fact that she can be held up against the cage against probably her best asset is holding someone against the cage and using dirty boxing. So, Maria, I'm going to take Pennington. No bet. I'd rather play the over two and a half. It's... Probably a parlay piece. I don't see a big likelihood of a finish here. Like I said, Pennington's usually pretty defensively sound. Uh, Vier, she also doesn't have a good finishing upside. Vieira is not bad uh, as far as defense either. She can get hit a little bit, but I don't think Pennington has, has enough power in that shot to like get the KO. So I do think this one's going to go over the two and a half. Probably stupid odds on it. I don't know what they are. They're not out yet as far as I know. But uh, So I'm going to take Pennington just for the pick. Not super confident in it, but let me know what you guys think. Let's right go to the next We have one. a middleweight matchup between Roman Kopilov taking on Punaheli Soriano. Both guys 9-2, and 3-2 two, and two in their last five. This matchup is kind of interesting because both guys, to me, seem like their record show or their record would indicate that they're better than I think they actually are. I don't think either guy's bad, don't get me wrong, but I think, you know, with, with the way that they kind of come, came in with, you know, some decent level of hype around them, I don't think either guy is going to really ascend to too high of a level in the UFC. This is kind of just going to decide which one ends up falling down on the roster and which one kind of gets to stay at that middle tier, uh, middle weight there, you, right on the roster somewhere that's like, you know, yeah, you beat them, that, okay, that's a good win. Or you beat them and you're like, yeah, you expected to beat them. Which one's going to be at that which category is kind of where we're going to get at here. Uh, for Kapilov, he does have the height and reach advantage. Six foot with a 75 inch reach. Uh, for Punahili, he is 5'11 with 72 and a half inch reach. So nothing ridiculous, but it's there. Both guys uh, are probably going to want to use their striking here. We have the kickboxing of Kapilov. He's pretty good in the kickboxing department against the power striking, just wild wing and shots of Soriano. Um, he does have good offensive wrestling. He just doesn't use it very often. He'd rather just stand and trade with you. Uh, it's going to be tough to take down Kapilov, though. He has an 87% takedown defense in the UFC, which is pretty impressive if you ask me. Both guys are going to struggle off of their back. Neither guy's really, uh, really has much of a get-up game. Neither guy has really the the ability to do any submissions off their back or work to get a better position or sweep or anything like that both guys just kind of pour off their back um but the problem is one has good takedown defense the other one has pretty poor takedown defense so soriano does not have very good takedown defense but he's very durable on the feet copy love uh, his take he doesn't really do a ton in the takedown department but if he does i think he's going to be able to get soriano down so there is that um for me in this matchup though i think it's going to come down to a couple of things we're going to have to deal with, is the power of Soriano going to be able to get the chin of Kapilov? Is Kapilov going to be able to stay at range, work his volume, use that kickboxing, and, and overwhelm Soriano? Um, is somebody going to get a takedown in this matchup? I think if either guy gets the takedown, they're going to be able to control and do a lot of damage. So there is that. I would stay away from this fight entirely, but if I'm going to have to make a pick, which I do, and this is what I do on the channel, I've told you this before, I'm going to lean Soriano, but I will not bet him because I do not trust him one bit. I bet on him before, and I did not trust him. Um, I bet on him against Maximov, and I don't think Maximov is any good. And, well, guess what happened? So, either way, uh, Soriano is the pick. Barely. 
Well, let me know what you guys think. Let's go to the Ask next. me. This featherweight matchup between Dan Ige and Damon Jackson is the people's main event. This is my main event. This is the fight I'm most looking forward to. We have one of my favorite fighters in the entire UFC in Damon Jackson. So yes, I might be a little biased, but I'm going to try to break this down as evenly as I can. For Dan Ige, he's been on a bit of a slump lately. One and four in his last five fights. He's fought some top-level competition, so you can't blame him in all those. And there's a couple of fights where they were real, real close. Um, on the other side, 4-1 and one for Damon Jackson. His only loss in the UFC since he's returned to the UFC. Yes, he had that stint clear back in 2014. That's a lifetime ago. Uh, either way, Damon Jackson, his only loss since he's returned to the UFC is to Ilya Taporia. And I don't know if you guys remember how good Ilya Taporia is, but he just made Bryce Mitchell look like, look like garbage. And for me... That is a huge, huge win because Bryce Mitchell is pretty darn good. At least I thought so. I had him win in that fight. Uh, I mean, before the fight, obviously. Once I watched the fight, I realized Taporia is way better than I thought he was. So if Jackson's only loss is to Ilya Taporia, that says something. He made short work of Pat Sabatini in his last matchup. And Pat Sabatini was a guy that I thought pretty highly of as a prospect coming up. Pretty good fighter. He made him look like nothing. So Damon Jackson's the real deal. He does have a very you know, pronounced height advantage in this matchup, 5'11", as opposed to 5'7". The reach advantage is the same, but I'm going to explain this again because I've explained it to a lot of people before in some of my other videos, so bear with me. I won't take too much time on it. Just because their reach is the same does not mean that their reach is the same when it comes to strikes. Here's why. Reach is your wingspan, right? Your fingertip to fingertip reaching across. We're talking about punching or striking, but typically punching when we're talking about reach. Damon Jackson's head is going to be higher than Dan Ige's. Already, when you're punching someone that's the same height as you, your arm starts here. So when you punch, you want to punch a little higher because you're trying to hit them in the face typically, right? Well, if you're Dan Ige, you may have the same arm length, uh, including the shoulder distance, as Damon Jackson, but you're now punching up. Now, if you want to prove that this is this is, this is a thing, you can use do a test with a wall. <laughs> Bear with me. Put your arms forward and walk towards the wall like that. You're going to reach the wall at whatever point, mark it on your feet. Then raise your arms up to a five foot 11 or whatever the disadvantage in the height would be on here. And then walk towards the wall and see where your feet land. It's going to be closer to the wall. So what that means is although the reach says it's the same, Damon Jackson's going to appear in this matchup to have a better reach. I have to explain that because people don't think about that. Yes, it seems obvious when I explain it. But when you just look at the numbers, it doesn't look that obvious because on paper, it's, it's not the same. You don't, you don't, you don't think about the, the height discrepancy, meaning also a bit of a reach discrepancy, even though they have the same wingspan. So that's what I'm getting at here. Either way, this matchup, if this stays on the feet, Dan Ige has the better boxing. He has the power in his hands. He does lack in the reach, but he does have power and he does have better boxing. He's going to work the body as well to negate some of that, that height disadvantage that he's going to have. And he's very good at doing so. For Dan Ige, his chin is legendary. The guy can just take a shot and it does not slow him down at all. So for him, his best path to victory is keep this fight standing and use those tools. He does lack when he gets taken down. Uh, working off his back is not his strong suit. Um, and he will do what he can to get back to his feet and use the striking there. So if he can keep this fight on the feet, Dan Ige's got a really good shot in this matchup. On the other side, Damon Jackson's got good wrestling, and he uses that striking. He has decent striking, and he uses it to set up that wrestling. The reach advantage here is going to help him out in this. He is going to be hit, able to hit Dan Ige before Dan Ige can hit Damon Jackson. And if he land a couple of shots there, set up the takedown, use that to, to control, because he does a very good top control or back control even, he will be able to use that to bank rounds, bank minutes. Now, we saw it in the Dan Argetta fight. He was able to bank minutes, even though he was getting hit over the shoulder, he was still able to have back control, and you can't really... I mean, that's it's hard to win a fight when you have somebody on your back the whole fight. So I do think Damon Jackson has the advantage there. He does a pretty good, pretty darn good Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he's also a very durable fighter. I don't see Dan Ige putting him out with one shot, but if Dan Ige can sling together some combinations, I think maybe he will. Here's the thing, guys. I'm a little biased here. When the odds open, I believe Jackson was a slight favorite, like minus 140 or something like that. Jackson's now an underdog, and that's insane to me. They keep giving me Jackson as an underdog, and I'm going to keep playing the dang thing. So I'm playing Jackson again. Uh, I think I'm like three or four units deep already. I'm, it's probably getting out of hand. I, don't, I shouldn't be that crazy on it, but I like Damon Jackson in this matchup. I think he has more ways to win. I think he has the better upside. He's on a, he's on a streak where 
winning and losing is a habit. If you if you are in the habit of losing, you're going into a fight thinking, man, I really need this win. I've already lost how like four of my last five fights. Um, I think he's lost five of his last six, to be honest. That wears on you. So for for losing that many fights in his last five or six, it's a rough time to go out there and say, I have to get this win. And Damon Jackson thinking, hey, I'm on a streak. My only loss is to the guy that just beat Bryce Mitchell, who was undefeated, and made him look like crap. So I'm feeling pretty good. I just steamrolled Pat Sabatini, who has also beaten plenty of people in the UFC as well. I'm riding a wave of momentum. Momentum's a real thing. Damon Jackson, I'm picking him here, especially if you're going to give me him as an underdog. However, here's the only thing I would say. If you were smart enough to bet Damon Jackson... I mean, Danny Ige, sorry, when he was a underdog, when this fight was, you know, first posted, and now have Damon Jackson as the underdog, bet them both equal amounts and just take the money and run, guys. Why waste time screwing around with trying to pick who's going to win the fight when you can have free money? I didn't do that because I thought, oh, Damon Jackson for sure is going to win the fight. I was dumb. I wish I would have done it because free money is better than trying to pick the fight right. Then you don't even, it doesn't even matter. It's just free. So... Do that if you had if you had the opportunity and you did play Ige early. Play Damon Jackson at plus money and you are set. Who cares what happens in the fight? Just enjoy it. Take your money and go home. Either way, I'm picking Damon Jackson. I really like him in this matchup. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if this is your main event of the fight, uh, you know, of, of the fight card. For me, it is, but I'll see you guys in the real main event, which we is now. We find ourselves in the main event for a middleweight matchup between Nazardine Imavov taking on Kelvin Gastelum. Now, this one's very similar to the last matchup, whereas one guy is kind of on a on a hot streak, whereas one is in a bit of a slump. Gastelum, 1-4 in his last five. Imavov, 4-1 and one in his last five. So, tail of different fight, two different fighters, two different streaks. Uh, for Imavov, massive height and reach advantage here. He's 6'3 with a 75-inch reach, as opposed to the 5'9", 71.5-inch reach uh, disadvantage on the Gastelum side. And a lot of that comes from Gastelum just being on the wrong weight class. The dude's five foot nine. There's no way he should be a middleweight, uh, but he is fighting a middleweight. But there's no way he should be a middleweight. Welterweight is even pushing it for being five nine. But I'll give him welterweight. Maybe he's just a little stockier. But I don't. I really think the guy should probably be a lightweight in a different world where the guy actually ate right, kept himself lean, looking shredded. Dude could be a lightweight at that point. But either way, Kelvin Gastelum, just a thick boy coming in at middleweight. We have Nasser Dean Imavov. He's coming in with a. Pretty darn solid kickboxing background. Pretty good kickboxing skill. Let's put it that way. He has counter striking and footwork to go along with it. That works out great against a guy like Kelvin Gastelum, who's going to probably come forward and let his face do some of the blocking for him, um, throw big bombs, try to hurt you. But that footwork and counter striking is going to be something that with the range he has, Imovov can really take advantage of that against Gastelum. Uh, he also does have some good grappling when... Uh, when the fight takes, when he gets the fight to the mat, if he's on top anyway, he does have some pretty good ground and pound, but he does struggle off of his back. So that's something we got to worry about there. Uh, on the other side for Gastelum, he's good, good wrestling. He hasn't really used it a ton lately. A lot of people speculate it's because of the lack of the cardio. Maybe it is. Um, I don't think so. I think he's got good cardio. I just think he's kind of gotten away from his wrestling. Maybe he's worried that his cardio will give out on him if he wrestles like that, like he used to. Um, but he does have some pretty good boxing in, in close. If he can get inside and make it ugly with the boxing, he does have a pretty good chance of landing some good strikes in there. He does hit pretty hard. Tough as nails, like I said. So he can eat a few to get in close. No big deal. Um, the problem with Gaslam, like I said, the wrong weight class, but the, the miles on the body. The guy's been in a lot of wars, a lot of tough, tough fights. He's only like 31 years old or something like that. But the dude's been in a lot of tough fights. Bad, back and forth, brutal fights. Uh, which is great for, for a fan favorite, but tough on you when you're trying to make a run at a championship again, you know? So... On the other side, the Imovov side, the biggest issue that a lot of people saw in his last fight was the cardio concerns against Buckley. Uh, third round, Buckley came out and just dominated that third round. And uh, that's because it looked like Imovov was tired. Imovov has said that it wasn't because he has bad cardio. It's because he wanted to really come out and hurt Buckley after some of the stuff Buckley had said. Well, what does that mean? It, maybe the cardio isn't an issue, but that means he's emotional. And if you're too emotional and you start making poor decisions in a fight because of your emotions, that can also be a problem. So there are some red flags on the Imovov side. I played him at, was it minus 195, minus 200? I can't remember off the top of my head. I almost regret it now. I think this fight is closer than it, than the odds suggest because I do think Gaslam's going to be hard to put away. In a five-round fight, 
I think that Gaslam, there's a world where Gaslam wins round four and five. And I don't know if you've noticed it lately, but the judges, if you win four and five, somehow just randomly give you another round at the, in the earlier part of the fight. So I could see Gaslam winning this fight with that being the case. I am going to pick Imovov here, though. I do think he's better at range. I think it's going to be hard for Gaslam to get in close and get the takedown. His takedown defense is not bad. Um, I, he's harder to take down. I, I think I'd give him good takedown defense. He's harder to take down than, you know, quite a few guys that Gaslam has been up against. And I don't think he's going to be able to work the wrestling. I don't think he's going to work the wrestling in as much as you'd like to see if you're on the Gaslam side. But uh, the boxing is there. He does have the shot. But I do think the range, striking, counters, footwork, that's where Imola is going to get it, get it done. I think he's going to probably win the first three rounds. After that, I don't know. Can he put Gaslam out? Yeah, that's a tough guy to put away. But maybe he can get enough damage accumulation that it'll be pretty hard for the judges to see it either way. Or to see it the other way. So for me... I'm going to pick Imovov. I kind of regret my bet. I mean, I, maybe I won't come uh, Saturday, but uh, I just think that the fight's closer than the odds are suggesting. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think Gaslam's got another shot to get himself back on the, on a winning trail here, get himself moving up the rankings again? Or is Imovov going to be one of the next, you know, top, t top contenders at 185? So what do you guys think? Let me know. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you guys next week for UFC, whatever the heck it is, 283. That's what it is. See you guys there.